All right, we're live. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this session of today's Horace's Extraordinary Meeting. My name is Ali Kuang, and I will be the moderator for this panel. So our panel subject is reconsidering the basic wage as a universal right, where we will be talking about universal basic income, or UBI, which is the idea that every adult citizen receives a set amount of money on a regular and reoccurring basis with little to no strings attached. We'll be looking at why we may want such a system as, uh, as pros and cons, and on a deeper level, how it might impact individuals, our economy, and our society as a whole. We'll also be looking at some practical considerations, like how entertaining discovery. And uh, let me start by making a round of introductions and give each speaker a first opportunity to make some opening remarks. Okay, so in no particular order. Um, well, first of all, let's uh, welcome Mr. Jorge Lopez from Mexico, the founder and president of Miras para El Tijo, El Rey Tijo, the number one provider of savings plan for individuals in Mexico. Jorge, you've been an entrepreneur for well over 30 years, a former diplomat and a board member for many private, public, and governmental institutions, um, as well as in other leadership roles in many organizations. It's great to have you here. How are you, Jorge? Thank you very much, Alec, and thank you all of, of my colleagues here in the panel. I'm super excited of the opportunity of sharing these experiences. Uh, it's clear that the world is living the most prosperous era in the human kind of history. Um, although there are a lot of errors in inequality and injustice lived and known to all of us, the political model has been evolving with pros and cons in the last, let's say, 200 years. Temporary political teams not necessarily have decided or implemented in the long term for the greater good. But we should celebrate advances and keep working in a more fair and better model. Um, having said this, I believe that this uh, universal income has, has to come through trust. Trust is constantly, constantly challenged in all of this. I am convinced, and it is my position here, that universal income for vulnerable, vulnerable segments, in this case the elderly, should be decided and implemented by clear funding originated by the built of wealth. It should be taxes or not, or it could be social security, or it could be NGOs, or it could be whatever other scheme that might help that the building of wealth in nations has been done by trade and investment. And if we link any kind of universal income to these specific variables, in the long run, it is possible to have universal incomes in these kind of populations. And just I will end with two examples. In my country, the president just um, in 2019 gave universal income to all people above 68 or 70 years old, depending on some demographics. Um, this is exactly in the right decision and this is exactly in the right direction. The complexity of this is the president did not show where the money is coming from. There's no budget aligned in our budget as a nation to deal with that. The example I'm using is the company that I founded three years ago is linking the consumption of every Mexican that has a social security account with voluntary savings to their daily expenses. And they are saving between one and 5% of these expenses in their social security account. And this is going to grow their pension uh, payment once they are 65 or 70 year olds between 17 and 21%. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm the live example of looking not only on the politic side, but sharing all that good things that we have in technology and economic development and not having linked 
a temporary political team or a specific idea on an NGO or a company. This has to be completely agnostic. I don't care what your credit or debit card is, and I don't care which is your pension fund provider. This is for all Mexicans from all Mexicans. Thank you very much, Alec, for your opening remarks uh, time that you gave me. Thank you very much, Jorge. You mentioned several very interesting and important parts from if there should be priorities to implementing uh, UBI to how to fund it and trade in investment. And of course, trust. That's the theme of today's for us this meeting. So I'll definitely get back uh, to you with some of these specific questions. So next, let me welcome Ms. Susan Danziger, who is the founder of Utopia Holdings. Susan, you are a tech entrepreneur and investor, and you are also a board member on several organizations, very notably, including Humanity Forward, which is the nonprofit started by the former uh, U.S. presidential candidate, Andrew Yang, whose presidential campaign had a centerpiece around uh, UBI. And in addition, you uh, launched, if I'm correct, one of the first small city UBI pilot projects in the state of New York, the Hudson Up project. So. Needless to say, a lot of your work is directly in the UBI movement. So I'm very excited to have you here and learn from your experience uh, regarding this subject. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate your, your having me. And um, yeah, I'd love to you know, talk about the experience, as you said, um, mainly with the pilot Hudson Up, um, okay. where we're really, you know, learning about what it is to be on the ground with the people who are receiving the basic income. I think it's, um, it's very easy to, to um, talk about economic policies and the role of government and um, the role of technology. But when it comes down to it, you know, it really is how does basic income affect people on a day-to-day -day basis. And the folks that, you know, we're dealing with are people who are worried about getting food on the table every day, um, people who are worried about making rent, people who are worried about, you know, taking care of their sick husband when they don't have, um, you know, that extra income that comes in. So, you know, the experience that we have, I think, is one in which I hope and wish everyone to have is to, to really understand you know, what it's like not to live just in the bubble, thinking about things on a conceptual level, but having that day-to-day -day experience with people who really need um, this basic income. Yes, definitely. That's exactly why we have these pilot projects, right? And it's important that you're taking the lead to, to do so, to test its efficacy and uh, demonstrate its effects. So yeah, look forward to digging into some of those very soon. So next we have uh, Mr. Andrew McGregor, a fellow Californian with decades of experience interacting with entrepreneurs, nonprofits, and policymakers on a variety of different roles. Uh, you know, Andrew, knowing the backgrounds of our panelists here, I can pretty confidently say everybody here is a very interesting person, but you actually hold the title of being one of Los Angeles's uh, most interesting people by LA Weekly. Uh, that's because of your many activities and accomplishments from being a writer, inventor, speaker, to an athlete, even a Grammy-nominated backpiper. So I won't try to list everything you do, but certainly I look forward to hearing your input to uh, our specific subject based on your very interesting background and experiences. Thank you very much for that wonderful introduction. And thank you all you out there on the interwebs um, sharing this message and engaging this dialogue. Um, yeah, so I do have an eclectic background, both in vocational training and education in uh, refugee camps in Africa and also in with homeless people in downtown Los Angeles. And I, I personally have at least two friends who have graduated from college and have experienced homelessness. Uh, so I'm very aware of how things can go very bad very quickly. And I want to speak to a couple of things in our culture and our country that are both very, very broad in the, our, our political application of them. One, and they're both acts of faith. One is that there's a faith that the jobs that are being taken away now will be replaced. And that comes from kind of the, the startup culture and like the American dream chutzpah. Um, I, I believe that's no longer the case. And it, it's a very, I actually would argue that in order to have a robust, innovative economy, you have to have universal basic income. 
Uh, for example, the trucking industry employs about 3 million people right now, and people are very well aware and support, generally in support of Elon Musk and those revolutions and also the, the new gig economy, da, da, da. So all these things are cutting people out. And the people who are being cut out are leading to the populist uprisings and are leading to the degradation of democracy. It's based in income inequality. It's not really an ideological problem. And so in order to smoothen this transition as just let's take the trucking industry of one industry of 3 million people who are going to be devastated by the effects of automation and the effects of this is before the pandemic, right? So now we're in the pandemic and automation is being increased because it's a public safety thing now, right? We need to be more distant from each other. So all of this is leading to the destruction of more jobs and America in particular always just had a faith. It's nothing more than faith that those jobs would be replaced. And I don't think like one algorithm can drive 12 cars or several algorithms actually, but the people losing their jobs are not getting new jobs with this new economy. It's just not. Um, the trucker is not getting employed as a software engineer. That's not sort of happening. So I, I'm going to argue very forcefully that universal income is necessary to maintain a robust capitalist economy. And then I would also like us to reconsider essential metrics we use for economic development, uh, primarily the gross domestic product, right? The summation of all goods and services. Um, there's an assumption shared by the political class and the media class that as long as the GDP is going up, we'll be okay. Um, however, that's no longer the case either because the GDP does not account for inequality. Uh, there's a classic feminist critique of the GDP that, you know, you can employ a housekeeper, but once the housekeeper has a spouse, the housekeeper, when, it was when he or she was employed, uh, was part of the GDP, but once in a relationship, that's gone. There's kind of a subset of that, which is interesting that I read recently, that if you buy formula to feed your baby, that goes in the GDP, but breast milk itself is not counted in the GDP. And it was estimated that the breast milk production in America is $110 billion, which is roughly the annual military expenditure of China. Uh, so you have you have things like this. And, and through if you look at the world through the lens of the GDP, like uh, an ad executive marketing oxycotton is worth far more to the GDP level than a paramedic who picks up people who have had overdoses. Like the Oxycontin causes divorce therapy to be needed to be purchased, things like this. So I think we do need to reevaluate our fundamental metrics of how we look at progress. and your thoughts. I'm looking forward to the discussion. Yeah, thank you, Andrew. Those are also very important uh, points, and that addresses some of the fundamental shifts of uh, belief we need to make, and uh, look forward to digging into those as well. So last but definitely not least, uh, let me welcome Mr. Brendan Davis, partner of International Troublemakers, Inc., a film production company. Uh, Brendan, you bring decades of experience both in the entertainment industry as well as in the cross-cultural space bridging uh, U.S. and China. In fact, you've been living in China for uh, many years now, just until the pandemic started, right? So you've been right. playing active roles both in these spaces, the entertainment industry and cross-cultural uh, business mm -hmm. events. And in fact, that's how you and I initially met outside the process in one of the uh, U.S.-China-themed uh, events you were organizing. So it's great right. to have you here, Brendan. Thank and you. the mic is yours. Thank you, and hi everybody. Hi to the to the guests. I will be very brief in my introductory comments because I think my my friends and panelists, colleagues have established the the conversation very well. What I'll say really quickly about my own take on this and why I'm here is um, building on everything that that everyone said. Um, my fundamental position on this, to be clear is that I believe the purpose of government is not to run, in this case, you know, is it, the U.S. is not a corporation. The point is not to maximize shareholder profitability, it's to support the people and social good. I mean, I, that's my take. So I am coming from that point of view. So I'm fundamentally having grown up 
you know, working middle class and in Atlanta, far away from this industry. Atlanta is a hub of Hollywood now, but it wasn't when I grew up, you know, 53 years ago. So um, my fundamental point of view is that in addition to what has been stated, societal good at the high level, the low level, at the, at the human level, whether it's, as Andrew spoke to about cross-training, retraining displaced workers because of AI, machine learning, automation, what's happening. The reality is that people looking to get started in the world or to transition or retrain, et cetera, have got so many challenges already. And those challenges are only exponentially more difficult as we move forward with all the things going on and that have happened. And so... My point of view is that it must happen in some way. And very specifically, what I would contribute to this is that I would like to envision more ways for public-private partnerships, for private business to also help support people making these transitions. But I think something like a UBI, as Jorge was saying, if I'm paraphrasing appropriately, that essentially having this base – gives a platform where everybody can at least begin to further themselves and evolve into whatever to, to meet the future. So I'm going to keep my comments. I'm going to stop it for there for now so we can get into this. Thank you, everybody. Well, appreciate it. Thank you, Brandon. And uh, thank you everyone for the initial remarks. So let's get into some questions. Well, why don't we start with the bigger picture with something, Andrew, you mentioned. Uh, we've been living in a world where GDP is the supreme measure above all in terms of assessing economic progress. Um, but it doesn't uh, reflect the well-being of people in the society, as you mentioned, or uh, assign appropriate economic values to the variety of different things uh, people do and contributions they, they perform. Uh, when you mentioned, for example, the breast milk uh, example, I believe only uh, a like Denmark or, or one other country that uh, attempted to uh, make that assessment. So I wonder, how do you think um, our discussion around the UBI promote um, a shift in our focus and possibly to a system that would properly um, give value to a variety of different activities people do? And how is that achievable given some of the uh, obstacles, political and otherwise? Yes, thank you, thank you very much. Um, so I think it's interesting to look at the history of GDP. It was only invented in the 1930s. Uh, so it's not part and parcel of capitalism at all. Um, and then it was used as a very valuable metric uh, during the World Wars to evaluate you know, the efficacy of another nation's military and output and factories and da-da-da. It did serve that role. And there is some correlation between GDP output and economic well-being, right? If you have almost no GDP, then you're probably not in good shape. Uh, however, it's it's used as this be-all faith, like our GDP is going up, we'll get through this. And it's good to have optimism, but that's currently the wrong metric. And also the GDP has been added to, right? Like the military is now part of the GDP. Advertising is part of the GDP. The financial sector is part of the GDP, right? So you get these Absurd situations where selling subprime mortgages makes you more valuable from the perspective of the GDP than an award-winning public school teacher, right? Uh, right. And it's, it's ultimately how we value our society and each other. And how this gets into the UBI debate is there's an assumption that people who are in poverty have a character deficit when the actuality is that poverty is a contextual problem, right? And that people have a scarcity mentality. If you're always worried about the power being shut off or the cops coming to evict you, um, you're not going to think in terms of your dreams, your family, or living a sober life, right? So that, like a lot of the health metrics get much worse the less money you have. You, The less money you have, you'll tend to be overweight, you'll tend to drink more, and things like this. These are sociological pressures that are coming externally. So a lot of the arguments against UBI, both on the left and the right, are rooted in the fact that someone like needs a hand up or something like that, or it's their fault because they don't have the work ethic, which gets into kind of Puritan ideology and our kind of founding philosophies. And, you know, like I've never seen anyone work harder than a single mother has to work two waitressing jobs just in my entire life. And I've been blessed to meet a lot of 
great and brilliant people. So it's it's a cultural stigma that's used to justify um, not helping our fellow humans and also our kind of economic status quo, which is just faith in the GDP and faith in progress. And we can still have progress, but we need to add, yeah, just our connections to each other and a future that we can all share together and that we want to build on. And again, I want to emphasize the point that humans will have an uprising before machines ever will for the people driving these new technologies. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. And that's some very, uh, that's some very relevant, uh, topics and, and, and input. So, and that gets into some of the deeper level, uh, reasons why we have been instilled the idea, like what type of activities or work is deserving of, uh, economic reward money. So, Susan, let me, uh, ask you this related question on a more psychological, uh, aspect, how people might perceive a UBI. Uh, how, why do we p give people free money? Isn't a person's um, financial gain supposed to be tied to the amount of work they do? And we live in a culture where we are praising the self-made man and people with uh, great work ethics. So how do we justify uh, giving people money regardless if they work or not? Right. Well, I think it kind of ties back to what the society values. And I think that, that, um, you know, Andrew made a great point about, about the fact that the, the GDP is so skewed that you're not actually, it's not actually valuing what we need to have valued. Um, so for instance, work on the climate is a great example, right? If you're, um, you know, uh, the climate is probably the greatest, uh, problem that's, that mankind is, is facing right now. And yet it's not rewarded. Um, you know, work with your, whether you're planting, uh, you know, your fields with, uh, with trees that should capture carbon or, um, you know, doing it or, or, or any kind of work that, that, that helps the climate. That's not something that's rewarded. Um, the other thing is that, um, you know, there's this mentality that everyone has to work in order to, to earn their place in society. And I guess I challenge that, like who says that people actually have to work for a living, right? I mean, why can't, I mean, work in the traditional sense. So in other words, if um, artists per se, artists or musicians, like, um, you know, they have these passions and creative outlets, but those are not necessarily uh, 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 things that people do that are valued in society with, with, with money, right? I mean, except if you're a really famous musician or artist, right? So who says that you have to, you know, that, that slinging burgers for what, however, you know, a couple few, you know, $10 an hour or whatever it is, is a better use of your time than actually pursuing your passion to, you know, to create great muted music or art or, or art, you know, architecture. And, and so I think we just need to reevaluate reevaluate what society values as a whole and how we spend our time. That is absolutely uh, correct and important. And, and since you are mentioning the various uh, jobs and types of work that will be impacted, let me bring that to Brendan, because you're a creator, you're a filmmaker, <laughs> and I do want to ask your opinion on the type of impact in the creativity and artistic areas. You know, we do live in a world where success is quite narrowly defined. If a student come out of school and develops a career as an engineer, a consultant, doctor, lawyer, he or she is generally considered rather successful. Whereas a lot of people with passions in uh, the arts, music, poetry, literature, etc., often have to sideline them because of financial considerations. Honestly, it doesn't make money, so you cannot live on that. So how can this discussion promote uh, change or impact in these areas, Brendan? I think that's that's a great question and building on what everyone's saying. Um, in my own case, you know, from, from again, seeing my own journey, what, what Sue's saying, the value of work and the value of what you're doing with your time, the fact that the arts and entertainment are how we form new perspectives. It's how we learn and develop empathy and all these important soft skills that translate into hard benefits in society in the long term, but the connectivity between cause and effect is a little hard to track. I think that what would be a significant benefit is especially specific to arts and entertainment is providing the ability for people to 
intern outside of a traditional context with being in a university program, for instance, because as we know, internships now to make it fair to the intern, the internee, there's a, there's a, there's a concern about asking people to do free work and being taken advantage of. I will tell you that when I started in my, in my career on the technical side of film and TV, and it's been a, a 30 plus year career from my film school training and through working on the technical side for 15 years and becoming a writer, producer, director, this took a long time. And it's very difficult. And any of these artistic careers, the people who are writing things, writing songs, writing books, creating companies that have a socially driven message mission, or, you know, those people, some of them may be from wealth and means and have the support to develop their ideas and their networks with that support. But there's so many valuable people getting to the idea of who's worth it. There, there's this assumption that bothers me, especially in my business, because, you know, once you're moderately successful or better, it's sort of a fancy job in industry. And there's a lot of, you know, there, there's a lot of social kind of capital that comes with having any success in, in, in this industry. My job in particular as a producer, Andrew Wirt lives in Los Angeles and is in this and, and other industries. There aren't that many people who come from basically poor backgrounds to be successful producers versus people who come from a middle class or more upper class background because it's related to understanding business and finance as well as soft skills and artistic skills and storytelling it's hard to become that sort of person. And there are many industries where you could say, how do you become this person that makes a difference and a change? And you're missing so many great people. So I would like to see UBI as part of a social good platform along the lines of a new deal that's meant to empower those who are marginalized as well as those who, who do not have a, another point of access and be able to on-ramp people, whether, you know, so you, whether you are, to use Andrew's point, whether you're a trucker who maybe you're not going to become a coder, but there's certainly other things you could learn to do. And so having UBI with no questions asked, there's no means test, there's no IQ test, there's no, here's how you prove that you deserve to live in our society. You know, I, I, I feel like in the arts in particular, you would get so many people contributing who right now just don't have the means to consider it. Because, I mean, to Andrea, my mom was a single mom working three jobs. You know, I started working at 14 years old, like working with a job at 14. And so I would like the ability for anybody to be able to access and dream as big as they want to dream. And um, I think that you would get the society will benefit from having more people in the artistic conversation, which shapes society and points of view than simply those with the wealth to have the privileged position. I feel like everyone should have the right to prove themselves. And, and, and this would, would really help that. Thank you, Brandon. I think that does address a fundamental uh, matter that we're talking about, how to how you guys can provide a foundation for people to pursue what is meaningful for them and what is arguably more meaningful for a society without a dollar amount assigned to that. Um, Jorge, let me go to you. Um, we mentioned this before and you mentioned in the opening remarks. So how universal should a UBI be? Should we advocate for something that's literally uh, covering everybody or should you somehow compartmentalize it and assign certain uh, priority given practical considerations or political considerations so it can be a, a more realistic uh, path, a pathway to uh, leading to the success rollout? Thank you, Alec. Um, just listening to everybody, what comes to my mind and, and trying to answer your question is, 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 is the next idea. The problem is access, is access to welfare. It's not welfare, to wealth, it's access. And let me use the example of, let's say, renewable energy. It's not I, that I want to pay for having energy in my house so I can use everything. But at some point, I do believe that the cost of acquiring electricity from the sun is going to go nearly to zero. 
So from this perspective of this basic universal income, part of that income should be measured in energy. And that goes exactly to what uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Andrew, was, was saying. It's not how we measure the GDP in just in dollars, US dollars and PPP correspondent to each and, and, and every kind of country. The thing is, what is the use and what is the benefit of what we're creating if, if either it's energy in this case or artistic value as, 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 as we were talking about with Susan and, and, and Brandon. The thing is, how can we trust that the incentives in a hundred years are aligned so the basic universal income is going to benefit and let me compartmentize this in several markets, let me say it this way, from the most vulnerable to the least vulnerable. And that's the, the profound idea that I'm trying to, to communicate here. In the case that I work is on the pension funds. And of course, I'm trying to diminish poverty for the elder. So I'm not working on pension funds for the rich and the beautiful. I'm, I'm working on how daily expenses on a mom that might have three jobs, as 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 as, as um, uh, Brendan was sharing with us, might all this consumption of every week bringing money to the house should be considering part of that. on an individualized accounts on a defined contribution as the way I'm doing in Mexico uh, in this in this example that I'm that, that I'm explaining here so um, I do believe that we should be cutting the elephant so we can eat it completely we cannot go universal income for everybody uh, day one and, and and it's not like like turning on the light we should address the problem and use all the technology and use all the evolution that the humankind has bring so we can keep free things. Let's say, let's begin with electricity. I am sure there's a big subsidy in the European countries that at some point is going to be completely amortized, amortized. Okay, let's use that in advantage. So let's bring electricity to people and that's part of the universal income. It's not a paycheck in your door every month because I'm not sure that that paycheck is going to give the same results that useful universal income of things around that you that you might use um, for living a better life and maybe spend your time doing art. And I totally agree on that. All right. Thank you for that input, uh, Jorge. And that has a lot of practical uh, factors and considerations behind it in terms of how to uh, really realistically roll out s such a, a system. So speaking of practicality, and there are some questions in the audience about uh, political perspective. Um, Andrew, let me uh, maybe ask you this question. Um, we're technically still in the COVID-19 pandemic. And over the past year or so, we all know many people are financially devastated because of the economic turbulence, a loss of job, et cetera. Um, pandemic relief has been a very important factor that helped people sustain through this difficult period. And there has been an overall acceptance of pandemic relief, even though that has added huge amounts to national debts around the, uh, around the globe. So do you think this pandemic relief and our, our acceptance to it facilitates um, a discussion towards UBI or could UBI be considered some type of continuation of this type of uh, state contribution? Uh, yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, I think it's important to mention that UBI doesn't necessarily have to be in a specifically poverty reducing mechanism. In the state of Alaska right now, for example, every Alaskan receives 1200 between one and two thousand dollars per year just by being in Alaska as a result of oil revenue 
And so the concept itself can kind of be that general. And it also cuts to an, a notion of how do we treat people who are impoverished, right? There's kind of a catch-22. Speaking of the Los Angeles experience, if you want like an apartment from the government, kind of like some Section 8 housing, you have to prove that you're insane, that you're indigent, right? And so people who have been displaced by COVID, you know, are just like, ah, what? And then my job came and got rid of it. Um, now have to kind of go prove you're mad, go prove you have schizophrenia, to get an apartment just to like, take care of your, it's, right? So we probably don't want that as a society. And then, yeah, it's, I think it's important to look at the stimulus checks. That's by far what people cared about. And they were given so begrudgingly, right? It was like one nine months into it, and then the other one for 1400 just came on St. Patrick's Day. But there was no regularity of it. There was no sense of, all right, we're going to do this. And there's, I think, just this entrenched – and plus, the stimulus checks themselves were just a minor part of the overall package. So for some reason, people are hungry, people are being evicted, and there's a plague, right? We're in a pandemic, and there's still this begrudging sense of, like, fine – but if you look at other American disasters, like um, oh Katrina, for example, I had some some buddies in, who FEMA just gave out cash cards, and it was fine. Um, there were these kind of debit cards, so it's not without precedent. It is kind of this cultural neurosis of how we deal with poverty and how we deal with government assistance, right? Like I I don't want to rely on the government. Um, but yeah, the stimulus checks people have accepted, like right and left, they're extremely popular. They're probably the most popular thing the federal government has done since even pre-9-11 days, right? Where right. You know, the disconnect between the federal government and the average citizen was finally bridged in some meaningful way. It's a palliative, but I do believe that's the ideological and humane precedent we need that we can actually demand an extension of regular stimulus checks because they, they do. They benefit the local economy. People are paying rent, buying groceries, and fixing cars, right? These are the small businesses we need to support uh, or we're not going to thrive as a culture and a people who certainly won't come through this pandemic in any sane way. Thank you, Andrew. I do agree with that. And I do think it's important that we do look into precedents uh, to assess its efficacy. And you mentioned Alaska and there are also other uh, variations of pilots, trials and different programs around the world. Uh, speaking of that, Susan, you know I'm going with you with this. Uh, you are really a pioneer in the UBI movement because you uh, co-founded the Hudson Up Project, which is one of the first trials, UBI trials in the U.S. Uh, share with us some of the information related to this program. How did you design this program to achieve its intended goals? Why is it in Hudson, in the New York State? How did you select participants to receive this disbursement? How was it funded? Uh, and related. Sure. Consider. Yeah, thanks for the question. So um, Hudson Up is actually, it's the first small city UBI pilot in the U.S. Hudson is a tiny little town, 6,000 people. Mm. Um, we selected it because it's a perfect microcosm of every small town or a lot of small cities in, in the U.S. Um, it has an incredible diversity um, of folks, um, some some of which are incredibly wealthy, um, a lot of uh, are very poor, a big um, black population, a big um, Latino population, a big um, South a um, Asian population, a huge creative class. So it really, and it, and it has, you know, there's gun violence. I mean, it's sort of all of the, um, you know, problems that, that lots of cities around the, uh, the U.S. and, and, and world um, face. And so we thought that it would be a great place to, to hold a pilot. Um, so the pilot itself, just to give a little background, it's um, we've, uh, there are 25 participants, um, each of whom are receiving $500 a month for a period of five years. So it's actually the longest running um, pilot um, in the U.S. And, you know, the reason that we made it five years as opposed to a year or two is we really wanted to test the long, you know, how, how people could um, respond in the long term that they, if they wouldn't, you know, we we believe um, that if there's a much longer time horizon that their decisions won't, you know, they won't think to themselves, oh, I'm going to lose it next year. So I can't 
you know, leave my job or I can't take risks. And so that's some of the things that we're, we're proving out. There's a study that's associated with it. Um, in fact, just today, um, we had an update on um, some of the findings. And it seems that it's tracking very well um, what is happening in um, the city of Stockton, if you've been if you've been following what um, what's right. been happening there, um, we found you know people are able to leave um, domestic violence situations. Um, people are um, much more are, are thinking financially about the future rather than just you know day to day in you know putting food on the table. Um, they're thinking about starting businesses. Um, so um, it's super interesting, and um, we think. You know, we're, we're very optimistic um, about that its future. And we think that pilots themselves are critical to determining U o UBI rollout on a big government level um, because we can test, you know, the amount of money, how it affects people, you know, how it should be administered. So lo lots of findings, I think, could be useful. Oh, thank you, Susan. Maybe just a very quick follow-up question. This being something so new, what were the main challenges and obstacles you've encountered? Yeah, great question. So um, one of the challenge, big challenges we had is we wanted to make sure that people who participated in the pilot wouldn't actually lose their benefits and be mm. worse off at the end of the pilot than they were at the beginning. Because once you're kicked out of your benefits, it's super hard to get back in. Right. Um, and so it was you're trying to figure out if um, there's so, if people are on Social Security or SNAP benefits, you know, ensuring that Either they knew the risks, um, but more importantly, you know, just to understand how we can um, make sure that they're that they're not worse off at the end. Well, appreciate it. That's uh, that's worth paying attention to. I encourage everybody to look at this uh, pilot program. And I look forward to hearing more updates on this as the results uh, come in later. Uh, Jorge, you mentioned something about trade and investments and how that contributes to our discussion. And I think that's important because we need to figure out how to fund such a, a program, which would be a big spending item for any governments or private uh, entities. Could you uh, elaborate something on uh, about this thought? Sure. I've been an entrepreneur all of my life, 30 years ago. I mean, I mean, I'm not, I'm not that old. So 30 years, a long time. So right. in this case, uh, a great example is entrepreneurs organization. This is more than 14,000 persons building wealth and giving to society not only money through the businesses they're doing, but also bringing a lot of innovation. And the thing is, the government, and, and I go back to the trust thing, the only way to produce is through capital and human labor. That's the only way to produce. And that's that's economics. That's, that's not a surprise for anybody. So the thing is, how can we trust each other in order to distribute this wealth either in cash or in goods and services? And the entrepreneurship experiment for me has been exactly one of the ideas that you should be using because the trust that you do once you're building an economic transaction with either a client, a prospect, an employee, a shareholder, even the government is a long-term trust. So I am totally convinced that this kind of universal uh, basic income has to take in account the production or, or, or the, the construction of wealth. And this is done by entrepreneurs and company owners through, tr through trade and investment. Now we have to connect that to a trustworthy organization or kind of organization that actually delivers to everybody. This conscious capitalism or this circular economy or whatever you want to 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 baptize that that concept that's a way to go well appreciate it jorge that's uh, indeed that again comes back to the center of today's for us theme which is trust so given that we're cl uh, closing to the end of this session maybe what we'll do is just a quick uh, half minute closing uh, thoughts from each of you, and we will conclude this meeting. I do believe we covered a number of areas and uh, quite efficiently. Uh, should we start with you, Andrew? Oh, certainly. Um, thank you all again, and I appreciate it. Yeah, I just wanna leave with the notion that this isn't a completely new idea. 
Actually, President Nixon attempted to do this as an extension of the war on poverty, um, and it passed the House of Representatives and it installed under a Democratic Senate. Uh, so it's it's not new. It's just been kind of twisted and buried, and it's something we need right now. I think we need it to continue to be the awesome, innovative economy that America has to produce those awesome entrepreneurs who just make it in all these spaces. And also the jobs that we're losing are not coming back and we need this thing. This will make obvious sense. I think in about 15 years, we'll look back and be like, how did we ever exist without this? But yeah, it's not a new idea. It's an idea that's been pushed all over the political spectrum before, and it need not be limited to an anti-poverty measure. It's just a human rights issue that we should all be able to live in this world. We have enough to make an abundant possibility possible. And let's all get through this together. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, Susan, let's uh, go to you. Yeah, thank you.